Hi and welcome to this week's edition of One Minute News from One Minute Economics, the show in which I cover the most important events of the week from an economic perspective. And I'm going to do this by uh, sharing some general information about each event in one minute and then continuing with a one minute detailed economic analysis. I'm going to start by analyzing a complete and utter disaster, which was the meeting between the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Theresa May, and the President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. And let's start with some generalities, and I think the photo I'm sharing speaks for itself. It's definitely a photo of two people who are not on the same page. And we have a clear divergence. You know, on the one hand, we have the UK that considers the European Union too rigid. And on the other hand, we have the European Union who thinks that uh, the negotiators from the United Kingdom are a bunch of dreamers. Now, um, I've, sh I've uh, published a video on One Minute Economics about what happens after Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty is triggered. And I'm going to link to it. But simply put, there are three options. One, an agreement is reached. Two, the negotiations are extended beyond the two years, and three, if no agreement is reached, then Brexit, uh, then a bit of a hard Brexit happens, and the UK simply leaves and reverts to the rules of the World Trade Organization. Now, um, some people say, okay, great, why not just go with option number three and save everyone all sorts of headaches? But I'm going to share an image with you that proves that things are complicated when it comes to the relationships between the European Union and various countries. And I don't know, there are a lot of issues. Like, for example, if the UK leaves, should it not even be a member of uh, the customs union? So, so should it have a worse relationship than a country like, let's say, Turkey? I, I don't think so. so uh, and, and therefore, I think it's important to... Uh, see things in a bit more detail. And speaking of more detail, I'm going to share three images in the detailed analysis. And uh, the first two are related to the exports of the United Kingdom, the one on top, and its imports, the one at the bottom. And you can notice just how tangled, how deeply interconnected the economies of the UK and other EU countries are at this point. So sure, uh, for, for the UK and the random country outside of Europe, you could say that, you know, the World Trade Organization framework is just fine. But for a country like the UK that has been a member of the European Union for so long and is so interconnected with other EU countries, I think it would be a mistake to simply limit ourselves to that. And in my opinion, it would be in everyone's economic but also political best interest if some kind of an agreement is negotiated. And speaking of political, I'm going to move on to the second aspect, and I'm going to share the third and final image for uh, this section, which shows the GDPs of the various EU countries. And as you can see, the UK has about the GDP of France and a considerably lower GDP than Germany, for example. So we can notice that, uh, economically speaking, the UK does seem like a dwarf compared to the huge uh, GDP of the European Union. And as such, if consensus isn't reached, and if the two parties end up becoming economic enemies, then maybe the European Union will, quote-unquote, convince its trading partners uh, not to be too gentle with the United Kingdom, and the political consequences would be dramatic. So in my opinion, from a political as well as economic standpoint, it would be in everyone's best interest if common sense prevails and some kind of a compromise ends up being reached. Let's now move on to the second and final order of business for today, which is the fact that Puerto Rico kind of filed for bankruptcy. Now, due to Puerto Rico's uh, special status, it cannot file for bankruptcy per se, but it has requested uh, bankruptcy relief in federal court, which is kind of like uh, filing for bankruptcy. And uh, generally speaking, I'm going to share an image right now which show, which compares uh, the, uh, the debt to GDP ratio of Puerto Rico to the state debt to GDP ratio of uh, 
the various states of the United States of America and you can see that Puerto Rico has been in bad shape for quite a while. We kind of knew this. And I think that uh, this current situation with Puerto Rico uh, is basically a bit of a canary in the, go in the coal mine, so to speak. And in my opinion, the main lesson to be learned from all of this is that um, perhaps bonds are not exactly priced correctly compared to the risk you're taking on. This is my number one argument with respect to them and uh, I've written this in my book as well. I for one avoid bonds because I'm just not excited about how I am rewarded for the risk I take on. And simply put, I believe that people consider bonds, be they corporate, municipal or even sovereign bonds, people tend to consider bonds um, let's say safer than history has proven that they actually are. And again, I consider uh, what's happening right now with Puerto Rico a bit of a canary in the coal mine situation. And make no mistake, there are more case studies where this came from. Moving on to a more detailed analysis, you can see that practically speaking, Puerto Rico just doesn't have nearly enough money to service its debt. And just like Puerto Rico, a lot of entities that have issued bonds and that have received financing at rates I consider too low as it is, a lot of the entities are in similar situations in my opinion. Now I'm going to quote some data uh, that, I, that I've also shared in my book, data from Reinhard and Rogoff from the 1920s to the 1960s, which shows just how quote unquote safe even sovereign bonds can be. Just pause this video for a moment if you want to, read the list carefully, and you're gonna notice a lot of household names on it. You're gonna notice that Canada defaulted, you're gonna notice that France defaulted, that Germany defaulted, that the United States defaulted, let's be honest. And all in all, I find it frustrating to see how bonds have this aura of invincibility associated with them. Like, you know, people, people tend to think that the idea of lending money to a huge entity such as a corporation, a municipality, or even a sovereign nation, it, it does tend to have a sophisticated vibe, like people used to say after the Great Depression, uh, that gentlemen prefer bonds and things like that. But ultimately, as an investor, I do have to say that based on this case study and many others, I cannot help but conclude that I just don't feel that people are rewarded properly for the risk they take on by investing in bonds. And for this reason, I, for one, consider bonds in general, plain and simple, unattractive. That's it for today, guys. Thanks a lot for tuning in. If possible, be active, comment, like my video, subscribe to One Minute Economics. And of course, if you can, I would definitely appreciate it if you could help One Minute Economics financially as well. And you can find more info on how to do that by heading over to OneMinuteEconomics.com. Have an awesome week.